This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Land Sharks We've adopted for ourselves a complicated job here at the GM Word of the Week. Every week we try to wear the hats of scientists, sociologists, anthropologists, historians, religious scholars, literary and cultural experts, including both the classical and pop literature and culture, and we try not to restrict ourselves to one continent or hemisphere or corner of the globe. In short, we try to be experts in everything, everywhere. Okay, not experts. We're interested lay people with a broad range of interests and a willingness to do a lot of research about some pretty silly questions. But that's not our point. Our point is this. Of all the things we do, the most difficult thing is usually figuring out the history of Dungeons and & Dragons and other games that serve as the loose theme that holds all of our episodes together. Because the history of D&D isn't as well recorded as most of the other topics we discuss. Heck, it's often easier to find something about the Dark Ages, a period in history that's been named for the fact that it's hard to know anything about it, than it is to research where the particular spell or monster or magic item came from in D&D. Take, for example, the rust monster, the owlbear, and the, the bull, the, the bu, the, the bu, the, the land shark. You know, B-U-L-E-T-T-E. The one whose pronunciation people are always fighting about. The rust monster is a flat insect-like thing about the size of a big dog. It has a tail that ends in a strange propeller-like thingy and two long feathery antennas. And when it touches anything made of metal, like armor and swords, with its antenna, that thing is reduced to a pile of rust. The owlbear is a dumpy-looking bear beast with the head and beak of an owl. And the land shark is a cross between an armored armadillo and a snapping turtle the size of a large cart or a small house that burrows effortlessly underground. It lives to dig into halfling burrows and devour halflings. Those are its favorite food. Or at least they were back when halflings lived in burrows and were legally distinct from hobbits, we swear. So where did those things come from? They have no basis in any sort of world mythology. No naturalist ever confused a bear eating an owl with a weird hybrid monster and added it to an ancient biology textbook. No sealers ever saw a land manatee and thought it was a burrowing turtle beast. Well. Would you believe those three monsters were all dinosaurs? No? Well, would you believe they were marketed as dinosaurs? And the reason they were marketed as dinosaurs to the creator of D&D was because of the American Civil War, German currency, and an economic collapse? Here's what happened. Gary Gygax found himself in a little dime store in his hometown one day. A dime store, if you're unsure, is a little store packed with useless off-brand crap. They also used to be called five and dime stores. Today, due to inflation, we call them dollar stores, or in England, pound shops, or in Japan, 100 yen shops. More generally, they are called value stores, or more colloquially, they are all one price stores. Now, one price stores have a very interesting history. And this is where all that stuff about the Civil War and German money and economic collapses come in. Most people who are savvy about the history of shopping, and there's probably not a whole lot of people apart from us who make that claim, which is why we get invited to so many parties, people who know the history of retail often credit American entrepreneur Frank Winfield Woolworth with inventing the concept of the value store. But in his 1919 autobiography, he admits all he did was make the idea popular and profitable. The truth is that after the American Civil War, one price stores started popping up all over the country. The basic idea was simple. The store would offer a mishmash of whatever goods they could get their hands on and price whatever they had at one price. 49 cents, 95 cents, 10 cents, whatever. In Boston, for example, you could walk into Pizer's 95 cent store and buy five yards of denim for 95 cents. Or two pairs of ladies' drawers or a wool shirt, or four towels, or nine bundles of cotton. All the stuff was either 95 cents an item, or bundled into a 95 cent bundle. And why were they so popular? Well, that's because of something called the Great Depression. No, 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 not that one. The other one. 
The one in 1873 that had to be renamed after the Great Depression of 1929 came along. See, that's the trouble with naming things the Great Whatever or the War to End All Wars. When another thing comes along that's even bigger or greater, you have to rename everything. Anyway, the story of the owlbear, the land shark, and the rust monster as D&D creatures begins in 1873. It, actually, it begins about a decade before that if you want to be really technical. And we do. It starts with the American Civil War and the Franco-Prussian War in Europe. Now these are sizable conflicts, and very complicated bits of history. So rather than going into them in detail, we're just going to say that they were pretty big military conflicts, and they cost a hell of a lot of money. But more importantly, they caused the standard sort of inflation that all conflicts cause. So settle in for a bit of economic theory. Inflation is an economic term. Basically, it means that the prices for pretty much everything you want to buy are going up. Now, that happens naturally over time. But for the most part, people's salaries and earnings also rise. It's like this. Imagine you make $10 an hour and bread costs $1 a loaf. Now, let's say five years later, the price of bread is $2 a loaf, but you're now making $20 an hour. You can still buy the same amount of bread for the same portion of your salary, so everything is fine. But what if the price of bread went from $1 to $2, and your salary only went up by a dollar? Now you can only buy half as much bread as you used to. That's the problem. Now, in a war, in just about any country, there is always a period of inflation. Prices suddenly rise. And that's because of two factors. First of all, the government is suddenly spending a lot more money buying things because an army needs all sorts of stuff, not just guns and bullets but food and cars and boots and cots and tents and, well, everything. And the government also needs raw material like iron and steel and rubber and gasoline and oil. And whenever someone is buying lots and lots of stuff, the people who have the stuff can charge more for it. That's the law of demand. The more someone wants something, the higher the price of the thing. But at the same time, in a war, suddenly a whole bunch of people aren't making things anymore. Some of the people who would normally be making cars and boots and farming food and smelting steel are tromping through a foreign country in army boots. And also, all of the goods that are being made aren't being sold at the store anymore. They're being shipped off to the army in some foreign country. So suddenly, there's a lot less stuff to go around. And so the stuff that is there gets more expensive. That's the law of supply. The less of something there is to go around, the higher the price of the thing. Now, once the war is over, things tend to gradually settle down. Prices tend to get back to the normal level. Sometimes. But other times, they get stuck at an inflated level. And that is what happened in the United States and in Europe, especially Germany, in the 1860s and 1870s. But then, two very different things happened. In the United States, there was a big, booming new industry. The railroads. America was covering itself in railroads, and everyone wanted to be a part of it. So people started to invest huge amounts of money into railroads, especially foreign investors. So business started to boom. But in Europe and Germany, things were not looking so great. Germany's money was losing value because prices were so high. So Germany decided to stop minting silver coins. Now, the German silver coin, the Taller, was a staple of European trade. Everyone used the Taller coin. And they'd been using it for years and years and years. In fact, it was so popular that some other countries named their money after it. For example, one country named its money the Dollar after the Taller. So the Taller was THE silver coin. If you traded in silver, you traded in tallers. German tallers set the value for silver across the world. And most of the silver for German tallers was actually mined in the United States. But now, Germany didn't want any silver to mint the silver coin the whole world was using. And here comes that pesky law of demand. The biggest buyer of silver didn't want silver anymore. So silver lost a lot of its value overnight. Now here's the problem. In the United States, we used a thing called a bimetallic standard to set the value of our money. 
Basically, the idea was that for every paper dollar, there is a dollar's worth of precious metal somewhere in a government vault. Your money has value because it literally represents a chunk of precious metal. And if you ever had to, you could trade in your money for precious metal. The US was using two metals, gold and silver. But when silver suddenly lost a whole bunch of its worth, the government quickly signed the Coinage Act of 1873. And what it said was that from now on, the US government wasn't dealing in silver. It wouldn't buy silver, it wouldn't mint silver coins, and it wouldn't use silver to back its money. That meant that if you owned a bunch of silver because you were an investor or you owned a big silver mine, suddenly you had lumps of pretty metal paperweights. Investors and miners were so infuriated by this that they called it the crime of 1873. Now this had a rippling effect through the American and European economies. Suddenly, a bunch of money had lost a bunch of value. In Europe, it had already been atrociously devalued, and that affected everyone who bought things using money, or who borrowed money to finance their lives, like, say, farmers who typically live on loans to stretch their money between growing seasons and through bad years. Meanwhile, in the United States, the railroad boom was slowing down and a lot of railroad projects were failing because, hey, you only need so many trains. And that meant both American and foreign investors were losing a lot of money. And lots of others were suddenly pulling their money out of projects. And then Chicago and Boston caught fire. Yeah, pretty much the whole of both cities burned down. It was pretty terrible. With all of that crap going on, the Coinage Act of 1873 basically steered the American economy into a brick wall. It just stopped. Dead. And when people realized what was happening, everyone ran to the banks to withdraw their money. And so banks ran out of money and went bankrupt. There wasn't enough money to go around, prices were ridiculously high, and everyone was losing their jobs as businesses canceled projects or just went out of business. In the United States, the depression all this caused lasted for about six years. In Europe, however, it stayed around for more than 15 years. And that's when the single price stores became extremely popular. See, those single price stores weren't like other stores that bought specific items from specific manufacturers to sell a few at a time. They bought anything, in huge quantities, from anyone. If manufacturers had junk no one was buying, they would sell it to single price stores cheap and in bulk. If a store or factory went out of business and had to sell off its remaining junk, they would sell that in bulk too, on the cheap. So single price stores had a little bit of everything at one extremely low price. And that was just perfect for struggling Americans trying to survive post-war inflation and depression. But then, Along came Frank Winfield Woolworth. Woolworth had seen the success of the single price stores firsthand in Boston. He watched customers flock to a new dollar store across the street from the general store he worked at as an errand boy as early as 1873. But more importantly, he observed a few other things. For example, in the more traditional store where he worked, a shrewd salesman would often gather old junk from around the store that had been sitting unsold for years the salesman piled all of that junk onto a five-cent table. And suddenly, it would sell. People didn't care what the junk was. Five cents was a bargain. People would buy anything if the price was low enough. Woolworth also had an interesting conversation with a handkerchief merchant. The guy made handkerchiefs for stores to sell at five cents a pop. The catch? The merchant also sold other small items alongside the handkerchiefs for a profit. People would buy the handkerchiefs because they were good value, and that would cause them to look around at the other items and buy them too. In business, this is called a loss leader. Sell an item at a steep discount to get people shopping at your store, and then sell them lots of overpriced stuff. Your local big box store still does this with its health and beauty department. Woolworth saw an opportunity in all of this. Instead of a 95 cent store or a dollar store, he was going to open a five cent store. Everything was going to be five cents. Woolworth and his brother opened the first Woolworth Great five cent store in Utica, New York in 1879. And then the business died. 
Actually, all of the single price stores died. As the economy recovered, and it became harder to get cheap goods in bulk to sell at any old price, most of the single price stores started offering higher priced goods alongside their bargains. And as the economy recovered, people started to become more discriminating in their purchases. They didn't have to rely on the single value store anymore, but Woolworth remained undaunted. He opened a second store and introduced a line of 10 cent goods alongside his 5 cent goods. And thus he invented the five and dime store. And that's when he started to innovate. He started buying huge amounts from manufacturers in bulk to keep prices low. Some he'd sell in his stores, but others he'd sell to business associates or other stores. He'd even buy stuff at discounts to sell to his competitors. That allowed him to buy massive quantities at steep discounts. He also approached manufacturers and had them manufacture some cheap, low-quality goods specifically to sell at 5 or 10 cents a piece. Meanwhile, his stores were well-decorated and brightly lit. They had rows of shelves and allowed customers to help themselves, which was an innovation in itself. See, before Woolworths, if you wanted to buy something in a store, you needed a clerk to get it for you. And so Woolworth invented the modern variety or dollar store. Ultimately, it was remarkably successful and continued to innovate after Frank Woolworth's death in 1919. By the 1960s, it had expanded into specialty stores and department stores, and even though the last Woolworth department store closed in 1997, you can still shop at a Woolworth store today. See, after Woolworth gave up on department stores, it changed its name to the name of its top specialty store an athletic shoe retailer called Foot Locker. And it's because of all this, the panic of 1873, German silver coins, and the entrepreneurial spirit of Frank Winfield Woolworth, that E. Gary Gygax was able to walk into a five and dime store and find a little baggie of plastic toys labeled dinosaurs, manufactured in Hong Kong. He paid less than a dollar for the thing, and when he got it home and broke it open, he discovered that whoever made it had no idea what a dinosaur was. Amongst the weird, misshapen plastic beasts was a beast that looked like a beetle with a propeller tail and long antenna, and a beast that looked like a fat, dumpy bear with an owl's head, and one that looked like a mix between a snapping turtle and an armadillo. The Land Shark This has been GM Word of the Week. It's written and researched by the Angry GM and produced by me, Fiddleback. You can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash GM Word of the Week. You can find more at gmwordoftheweek.com and theangrygm.com.